Welcome to an enlightened hour of interactive talk. This is Guided Spirit Conversations with host Marla Goldberg. In this program, we spotlight guests from all over the globe who have helped others change their lives and will provide you with the tips, tools, and techniques that you need to help you make a difference in your own life. Now, here is Marla Goldberg. Hello, everyone. How are you doing today? Welcome to Guided Spirit Conversations. I'm your host, Marla Goldberg. And I just have a question to ask. How's your fall going? We're one week into fall. Leaves are starting to change. This happens to be like the season of my heart. It's harvest season. Um, And I just love this time of year. There's so much beauty. There's beauty all the time, but this is different kind of beauty. It's spectacular. So I hope you're enjoying it. I want to introduce my guest for today, Indra Rinsler. Now, Indra is sort of new on his path. He's only been doing it about, oh, 50 some years. And so he works with his clients and teach by by his Vedic astrology and his Enneagrams, and he teaches all over the world. So we're going to talk about Enneagram and how Enneagram and life readings are helped, designed to help wake up the client to who they really are. So welcome, Indra. How are you doing today? I'm fine. Thank you, Marla. Thanks for having me today. Oh, it's at my absolute pleasure. So you've been doing this for a minute a long minute. Um, how did you get started? Because back in the day, what you, you know, your path was not one that was well traveled by the masses. There's more today, you know, walking the path, searching than when you started yours. What was the impetus, the catalyst to get you on your path? You're talking about 50 years ago? Yes. <laughs> 50 years ago. So I'm, I, my parents passed away of natural causes. My mother within a week of graduating when I graduated college and my father two years later. Wow. And so I had, uh, I had a freedom. And uh, in that process, I moved to California and uh, which I had been to before. And in coming to California, I was uh, uh, made aware of things that were happening out here in the early 70s, the, uh, the natural, first time we heard natural foods. Uh, we had uh, bookstores of spiritual books that we had never really seen before. And so I just started slowly. And uh, I think it was the Autobiography of a Yogi, the, mm-hmm. the classic book, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, reading that, finding that in uh, 50 years ago and reading that and uh, being drawn into that, um, I didn't really know any other way to be that I was looking for, um, I had an opportunity to work on myself and that seemed uh, a worthy subject, that seemed a worthy thing to do, that there were not externals that were calling to me. I had already grown up in Manhattan which was in the 50s, like the place to be. And I had already seen that it wasn't really there, at least certainly not for me. So that's how I got started. And so then how did you move into astrology? Well, actually, when I was buying those first virtual books at Shambhala Books in Berkeley, uh, they had spirit, they had astrology books there, and uh, I was mathematically oriented as a as a young child, and so I don't know, astrology just called to me, whether it's past life or whatever, I can't say, but at the time, uh, I felt that it was something that I needed to study. I don't, I don't know how other people work, but um, I do things and I study things. Uh, I don't need to know why, that the fact that I'm pulled towards it is enough. And I've come to find out, uh, I call it pieces. You get pieces of the puzzle and it happens over your whole life. And, and I don't need to know where that puzzle part fits. And I don't need to know what the puzzle is in Mm -hmm. order to embrace the puzzle part. And so I have done that, that I did astrology for very strongly for three, four years, and then it sort of stopped. 
and it didn't seem to be relevant. And other parts of my life, having raising a family and uh, living in a spiritual community were important until when those disappeared, that whole life disappeared, then astrology came back. I think a lot of us find that uh, your midlife crisis or when you have a, a change of life, the kids leave, you kind of get back to stuff from your 20s. Have you experienced that? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so and so we do that with a new understanding and a new a new interest and it's we come it looks like it's left field but when you get the whole picture you realize oh yeah i see yeah it all fits to, together because there are things we're not ready to know yet or learn and we can't understand fully it's so true and in addition we're so caught up with our lives you know doing you know trying to build our life build a family and you know be there for the build the children to guide them. And then when you get into another place, the children are grown up, they're independent. You now are like, oh, now what do I do? Or where do I go? And it shows itself to you again. That's what I've taken away from it. Yes, that's, that's the experience that I had. And so many, so many people I know, same thing. So now, did you do Western astrology first and then move into Vedic? Or were you, were you connected yes. to Vedic initially? Well, no, Vedic wasn't really well. I mean, Vedic is actually a, a marketing term. It, they actually, uh, I believe, invented that in the 80s. So it would have been Indian astrology in the 70s. But of course, the, we didn't really have that. And I lived in a, a community that, that had Indian roots. And so I had Vedic astrologers there. And when that started becoming popular uh, around me in the mid 90s, I started getting an interest in it. And uh I didn't really get back to Western. The, the astrology is the same. I like to say that since the Western astrologers don't agree with each other and the Vedic don't agree with each other, the fact that the Western and the Vedic don't agree, that's just a part of the game. That's just part of what it is. And so, um, yeah, I, I was more interested in Vedic because the sidereal chart, uh, sidereal time chart was of more, uh, felt more uh, right for the work that I wanted to do. Can you explain the sidereal time chart so for okay. people who wouldn't know what that is? Yeah, so so the Western astrology is based on tropical time, and the tropical time is the relationship between the sun and the earth, and that's a fixed relationship, and so March uh, 21st is Aries zero every year. But in Vedic astrology, we use sidereal time. Sidereal is star time, and so we take into account the the sky behind the sun. It's the earth looking at the sun and the sky behind. And we come to find out that the sky behind the sun every year is not the same, that the sun is moving through the, uh, uh, the, um, the solar system, the cosmos on a 26,000 year cycle called the precession of the equinox. And so the sidereal chart is slightly different. They were the same at 500 AD but uh, they're now uh, 24 degrees difference. It's one degree of 72 years. And so if you think of yourself as a Leo, I may think of it moves backwards. I may think of you as a cancer. And while that can be dislocating for people at first, the fact is that it has um, some benefits for the use that I like to do, what I want to do, which is to help people to wake up. In order to, to, in order to do that, I like the positions of where the planets actually are. When will the planet be at zero again? Do you know which, which year it would be? Uh, that would be 500 AD, 26, 26,500 AD. The planets will be at zero again. Wow. And it's, and it's going to be really interesting because in 5,000 years, we won't be merely three quarters of a sign apart. In 5,000 years, we'll be like two or three signs apart. And, and everybody, there's going to be some head scratching. Well, it'll probably have already happened by then. Right, but the whole trade, the whole shift and change when something new starts coming in, people have to adjust to it because there's a lot of times people are very comfortable in the space that they're in and they don't they don't move with the flow as readily as some others. Does, does that make sense? Absolutely. That's what we call fixed signs in astrology. <laughs> <laughs> so so I guess an insult would say, you're a fixed sign. That would say you're like stuck in your ways. We can do that. We say that. <laughs> stubborn. People can get stubborn and short-sighted. 
And it happens. It happens quite a bit. And people don't get, they just don't flow with comfort. The, the only constant in my world is, is change. But there are a lot of people that don't like change. They like to be very comfortable and stay where they are. That to me in astrology is an empty 11th, a 12th house. They have trouble with change. Okay. I love how you like refer everything to the houses. So how did Enneagram <laughs> move into your practice? So what happened was that um, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, I was uh, leaving the community that I had left, that I'd lived at for 20 years. And I was separating from my wife of 25 years. And uh, a friend had said, why don't you go take an Enneagram weekend? And I had never heard of any of this, Enneagram or Personality Weekend. So I took the weekend. And in the middle of that weekend, I realized that there was a connection between Enneagram and astrology, but I didn't know what it was. And uh, also that weekend, I had an inward inspiration that I wanted to share Vedic astrology. Uh, there were some parts of it that I particularly felt at that moment that I wanted to share. And so I had um, what I'm thinking to call right now a life mission, which, mm -hmm. which, which um, is not a term I would use a lot, but for some reason I feel to use that right now. I felt an inward pull uh, to explore this. And I was lucky enough within three months to find a man who had a system that explained how you could see Enneagram in astrology and uh, he was a hermit and I met only one of three people who knew where he was and where he was hiding and what he could do. And so I spent two weeks with him. Wow, that was probably very special two weeks. That was a very special two weeks. He was perhaps the most uh, exotic, uh, esoteric man I've ever met in a, in a lifetime of esoteric people. And so he really walked his talk. Yes, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Enneagram, how people find out what their number might be and how does it affect their life? So let me just, can I, if I may, I'll back Oops. up a little bit. So the Enneagram, Enneagram is a, is a term from Greek. It means nine-sided figure. And the Enneagram of personality is a teaching that says that there are nine personality types. So this isn't just an archetypal system. I believe it's the archetypal system that these nine types are the result of the Judeo-Christian uh, 2000 plus years of tradition of uh, conditioned behavior and conditioned thinking. And so these stories help us to recognize our own triggers and our own personality factors uh, and style separate from everybody else. It's, it's the same for people who have the same type, but it's different uh, for people who have a different type. And uh, how, it, how you find it out is you can, work with somebody, sometimes for many people, they can just read their, their tests with questions and you can answer that and find that pretty quickly. But some people are kind of complex and we can see it in the astrology. Some people will never know, a very small number will never figure out. I had a client who months later, he couldn't decide whether he was a four or a seven. In Enneagram, we use numbers. We also have names, but not everybody uses the same name. And so the process of, of uh, uncovering your number can be of your personality type of one of the nine is much like life is uncovering what your career should be and, and who you're going to marry and, and what's going to, what's your, uh, you know, what is going to, uh, what your interests are going to be and who your kids are going to be. It's, it's part of an unfolding process, though some can figure it out right away and others need some time. So, well, I think I know for me, I needed to take the test to find out what my number was. But is there a heading? So like number one would be called the blank. Number two would be, you know, where you would be able so, to sort of. So the one is the perfectionist. Okay. Two. two is the help. You want me to go around? Two is the yes, helper. Yes, please. So two, two, one is the uh, perfectionist who who uh, controls things uh, by making them by making uh, things be perfect, and what is perfect. 
they make it up to is a helper who helps other people because they feel an insecurity and a lack of love within themselves. Uh, three is the producer who, who is very productive, uh, makes things happen. Four is the individualist, they're very sensitive, they're very arty. Five is the observer. They use information to protect themselves. Six is the loyalist and needs uh, uh, has the issue with security. Seven is the enthusiast, that's me. We, we love greener pastures. The eight is the boss and is very str strong. They have no defense, it's all offense. And nine is the peacemaker who is looking to find um, harmony in a world that, that seems to not have any harmony. The harmony they're looking for is within. Which that's where you find harmony initially, isn't it? Like you've got to get, get rid of all the external noise and go within to really find the, your true essence, which in essence will give you the road to finding your harmony. Yes, so there's this difference between the story of peace and peace that, uh, that uh, we, we get stuck in the story of peace. You, 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 you can't disturb peace, but you can disturb the story of peace. And so most people think that their peace or their security or their, or their uh, perfection is based on a, is, it's based on a story and they, and they measure themselves that way. And um, that, that, that works for a while but it is not the ultimate when you're looking for the ultimate that it, that isn't that doesn't work that way it's it's fascinating and so i know we only have a couple of minutes left so if this is a short answer because we're going to go on break feel free of now we'll, we'll move in a different direction but how does enneagram work with astrology to find out what is going on in one's life okay so that is a complex question but there are <laughs> but th there are there are it is not a one-to-one. -one. People want to say that a, that a one is a Saturn and a two is a Mars and a three is a, is a Venus or whatever, but it doesn't work one to way. We're more complicated than that. So there are a number of different factors. And so in a particular chart, say um, as a one, the Mars is a little of uh, uh, is a, a little affected, uh, affected, and that's why they're not able to express their anger. And so I can see in a chart where quite often for one, the Mars is in the 12th house. So the Mars is ethereal. And so, so when they have anger and when they want, want to do, there's a lot of interpretation and thinking and, uh, 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 and feeling before they express it. And that's how it manifests. And so there are more, there are, there are two or three or four markers for each uh, point, the Enneagram point. And so I see that in a, in a chart. Uh, uh, sometimes it's uh, easy and sometimes it's more difficult to find. Interesting. Well, we're going to go on break. We'll be right back. Stay tuned for more conversation about Enneagram and Vedic astrology with Indra Rinsler. Stay tuned. All right, great job. We're all clear. Back in a couple minutes. Thank you. All righty. Okay. So, so I found that fascinating, especially because of um, there's just so much involved with it. But I want to talk about the various ways because you have what three or four uh, different. I don't know what you would call that, but in a, your astrology reading, how it breaks down. You know how you, if you go into your services, you have, you can have this, which has this, this, and this, or you can take this service, which has, do you know what I'm, I'm talking about? Um, not exactly. Are you talking about the three different parts of the life reading or are you? Yes. Okay. Yes, I yes, am. Yes, I, I use three different modalities in the life reading in order to give people a, a different perspective on themselves. Okay. Oh, I have a question when we come back on. Excellent. All right. I'm very excited. It has to do with um, the, our time, making time relevant. What does, wait, does that make the time of our birth less relevant is the question, which we will get on when we come back after break. Do you understand the question? Uh, yeah. Okay, you good. Good. <laughs> because we will uh, 
answer that on, on the other side of this commercial break. Did that make sense? No. Anyway. <laughs> sure. Anyway, okay, this is what I'm looking for. Um, yeah. So, um, what else is going on? Yeah, so we'll get that, we'll get that question answered when we come back. Um, 20, we back? 20 seconds till we come back, 20 seconds. Perfect, thanks. like having an inner Jiminy Cricket. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's like an orchestra leader. <laughs> Helps you keep time. Let you know when to start and stop your piece. <laughs> You are listening to Guided Spirit Conversations. To reach Marla Goldberg or her guest today, you're invited to call into the program at 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. If you'd rather send an email, the address is guidedspiritconversations at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. Welcome back, everyone. I'm here with Indra Rinsler. If you're just tuning in, Indra has been on this path for over 50 years. He is a Vedic astrologer and an Enneagram of personality life reader. And he combines the two in his astrological readings. Check him out at Indra Rinsler. That's I-N-D-R-A-R-I-N-Z-L-E-R.com. Check out his website, see what he does, how he does his astrological Enneagram readings. You have a few options to choose from. And welcome back, Indra. Thank you. So we have a question. So Teresa asks, does that make the time of our birth less relevant? I think we we're talking about what we ended our last conversation on. I think break. She I think she's referring to the tropical time and the sidereal time. And uh, I do want to say that that is the most important, one of the most important parts of astrology, and it is the least understood. It is the most difficult to understand. And yes, the birth time is just as relevant. Uh, the, the, all the changes is, is that we cast the chart slightly differently, and the, the planets, the planets uh, will be in a different location but the birth time is just as important. So let me ask you this question, speaking of birth time, different between tropical time and sidereal time. Sidereal time. Sidereal time, sorry. Um, if a Western astrologer and you went to neck and neck doing charts, would you find great differences in the information that, that you receive that you would be able to share with your client? So, uh, I mean, different, I mean, there's there's painters painters are painters but they they paint different subjects and so the painting the 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 reading could be completely different but the fact is and it's kind of interesting is that we both using a slightly different charts may come up with the same effects and why this is and you're you're getting to the hardest the core issues but these are not easy to understand is that i read in a book so so if you can follow with me for just a second i read in a okay. book that in about 5 or 10 years ago that was published in 1968 that referred to a, an astrology book from 1922 and it said that in this 1922 book there were 30 definitions for the planet for the sign Virgo. 10 of those were related to uh, to Virgo. 10 of them were related to its ruler Mercury and 10 of them were related to Leo because because uh, the Western astrologer sees uh, the client in Virgo, but I see them in Leo. And so some of those Leo characteristics have come into the understanding of Virgo. And because of that, when we do a reading, we come out with some of the same ideas, though we've come to it in completely different ways. So basically, you just take a different path and end up at the same campsite. That is, that isn't that the way life is? Yeah, what's meant to be is what's <laughs> meant to be, yes. 
Yeah, right. <laughs> so, that that there are many there are many truths, there are many paths, but one truth. So true. Speaking of truths, so let's talk about your readings because I know you have you have a few different options when someone goes to your website, which I just sent a number sure. of people to at indrarinsler.com. So let's talk about why you do it the way you do, because you have one life reading that offers three three pieces to it, to that puzzle, I'll put it, right? If I'm remembering correctly. And then sure. there's one where you have two pieces. But your astrology reading isn't just like, here, this is your astrology reading. You have you can pick and choose how it goes. Does that yes, make sense? I can't. I can't tell you why, but uh, what I do is I do a life reading and I've ended up with, this has been developed over uh, more than 20 years, is that I bring in an astrology, an Enneagram part, because I want to help people to understand their core triggers. And then I bring in the Vedic astrology part, because I want to help people to understand their strengths and weaknesses. And um, I, I can use, I now use the Navamsha chart in order to help people to understand where they're going to, where they're going to end up. I use the, the uh, uh, Mahadashas, the great period to explain the period that they're in. That's all within Vedic astrology. And then I have a third piece that I, that I use called the wheel of totality. And this is a, a part that um, shows the blank spots, the empty houses. People don't talk about the empty houses. They say that, they're, that it has a ruler, but I believe that the, that the empty houses, that all houses contain awareness. And if you don't have a planet there, then that awareness is hard for you to understand that you don't start working on it until in midlife because by midlife, you're not working on your ego. In 20s and 30s, you're developing your ego. And if I say yes. to you, you need to open your heart, then you say, no, I don't. But if you're 50 years old and I say, you need to open your heart, then you say, yes. I've had many people tell me that, how do I do it? And so, and so this third part, the wheel of totality helps people to understand what it is that they don't quite get. There's ignorance built into the system. Which is, which is interesting because you wouldn't think so, right? You go to an astrologer, they tell you all these things. You don't know what you don't know. So you don't know that there's something not built into the system, you know, sort of like a, a, a blank space. Right. So For there the are that's why we're here is because there's things that we need to learn. And so the wheel of totality helps us without any bias, helps us to understand what it is that we don't get. It's so fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So how do you find the power of place? Like, so the power of place refers to location astrology. So, so there is, uh, this was started in the, uh, in the seventies also, what a rich time it was. We didn't know all the stuff that was starting in the seventies. Right. So, um, so the idea, the idea is, is that we can, first of all, we can create a relocation chart that, that we, when, when I cast your chart, I say, where I ask two questions, where were you born and when? And so I fix time and space. And so, and, and so we can change time because there are people that do astrology based on, on conception time or first heartbeat time. I mean, there's not a lot of them, but that is the way that people do it. And, and we can but, also change location. Go ahead. How do you know when you were conceived? Because sometimes there's a little wiggle room there of a conception, you know, when the act is done and when it's conceived and first heartbeat time. What if there was no sonogram where you can hear the first heartbeat or when the first heartbeat starts how do you find that out i can't answer that at all it's not something that i do that i do but i'm saying that there are people that people do that, that do and it. they have ways that they have ways that they feel that that is really important to tune into that's fascinating and, and there's also people that do charts of death of your death time to look at stuff there so there are <laughs> So there are a lot of possibilities, but so we can change the place. We can keep the time, but we can change the place. And so where you are, perhaps when you were born, it was Leo rising, which means rising means that Leo was on the Eastern horizon, but 2000 miles away um, West, it was uh, Leo it was Virgo rising. And so we can cast a chart. The planets are in the same houses, 
I mean, in the same positions, but the houses change. And so we cast a relocation chart, which will help us while you bring your natal chart with you, you have an opportunity to freshen up because all of a sudden where your house, your son was in the seventh house and you relate to people through your relationships. Now, maybe your son is in the eighth house. And so your son relates to the world through transformation rather than through relationships. And so you have a different perspective. That's then, one aspect of the power of place. And so the power of place, astrocartology, is that what it's called? That, that is, then there's a second one called astrocartography. And these are lines that are drawn on a map to show uh, uh, power centers. They're the points of the uh, first, fourth, seventh, and 10th house zero point. They are said to be the uh, most direct uh, places of most direct energy. And so we and, put them on a world map. And then you and tell then, people. And then we're able to tell you where, where, you're, where, where good and bad places are for you. I have a, I have a client I'm going to work with tomorrow who has where she's at in Bali. She has absolutely no, no lines within 1500 miles. And she says it's not a good place for her and I need to go into it further. But I've had somebody tell me this before that she was in Amsterdam and there were no lines around. Oh, she was in Amsterdam and she didn't meet anybody and it was not a very good place for her. And there were also no lines within a thousand miles. And so, and so for a person who is on this, on a, um, on a, that is on a spiritual retreat, having no lines there, no ener planetary energy may be really good because it's very quiet. But if you're in your mid twenties and you're trying to have a normal life, then you may find that place to be not very conducive to what you're trying to do because there's not really an, a, 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 a strong planetary energy there for you to pick up on. I have connection. I know when you did my chart, because you did, um, where I moved to in North Carolina, you said was very beneficial for me. And it was a good place for me. Yes, as I, if I remember correctly, you had you had no planets in the one, four, seven, and 10th house. And when you moved to North Carolina, then you had uh, two of them filled up. I think you had a stellium, you had three planets in one house move from the second to the first, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And so it's a very energetic place there for you. And in fact, I think you agreed that you, you had more sense of self and more direction that you didn't have in your, in your other chart. And that's, that's how it works. It's rather amazing. It's, it's, it's sort of simple. It's sort of logical when you think about it, but it took me a long time to come to it. Well, and I think people need to understand that, you know, so for example, at one point, my husband and I were planning to move out to Colorado. Now, Colorado might not have been the beneficial place for us, for me. It might have been, like you said, those an area with no lines. And I don't know if it is or not, because I didn't look. But so that people know that to, to have a, a chart like this made, if you're planning to move homes, relocate for whatever the reason, whether it's for work or just because you have a whim. And you can do this for vacation as well to find out which would give you the most benefit in your travel. Would that be correct? Yes. And let me take you a step further that might blow your mind. There's a thing called remote activation. You don't actually need to go there. Oh, like remote viewing. Yes. Well, like remote viewing, absolutely. That, that, that if, you, if you find that your chart that Italy is really good for you, or let's put it another mm -hmm. way, that 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 you've been in Italy and it gives a a, a warm a warm mm -hmm. center to you and you remember the food and you remember the experiences and the Italian man and the gelato, and now you're in you're in North Carolina and you mm -hmm. and you miss that and so you can relive it you can relive it by your pictures you can relive it by your the the, the blouse you bought there you can relive it by uh, by your memories and by seeing an Italian movie or hearing Italian language. And so remote activation that you can, you can generate the energy of the place by bringing that energy into your life and also by connecting with people who are from there. It is, well, it's funny you bring up Italy because I was there and it was one of the most phenomenal experiences. 
So it's something that's easy for me to recall to bring back. Yes, and I have to say that many times I bring up examples, they seem to hit home. And that's part of the, that's the part of the power of, of, um, of um, letting go of your ego, you know, being in the moment that, that somehow you connect in with something and you have no idea what you're connecting in with. So yes. Yeah, it, and you can and you can also bring in the planetary energy. So in they in in, in astrology we have uh, remedials to try to help you. And while I'm not a particular proponent of gemstones, people do buy gemstones and wear them to help them with the planetary energy. But you can do the same thing by by bringing in the color of the planet by by having curtains of the color by wearing clothes of the color color by even having a, a ribbon of the color or bracelet of the color and and bringing that energy in a, a, a shower curtain a bath towel it will it will help to change your energy it does and in Chinese medicine it's the same way so I've I've studied uh, Chinese face reading and we do you know what they call nine star key which is Chinese astrology sort of you take the numbers and you can tell people about things but if things are off by changing the food, the clothes, the colors around you to bring in the, the those that you're not as strong in. I'm not going to say the word weak for that, but not as strong in. It helps build the resources that you need, you know, by by including those in your line of vision or your your body. Yes, that's absolutely right. Everything uh, as above, so below. Everything is connected, and so the power of place refers to the fact that uh, that even if you're not thinking of moving, but if you don't understand why you're not happy where you are, or that you uh, you you the reading can help with that, and it can it can suggest in in understanding. I believe in understanding what's going on. You do have. Um, you you're, you have more power. You have more in that understanding is an ability to be able to overcome it. It is. I was about to say, understanding is knowledge. Knowledge is power. And when you have that power, you can then make educated choices, decisions to guide you to the place that would be more beneficial for you in any area of your life. Absolutely. So what is there astrology, and I'm sure there, there is, but I'm going to ask this question anyway, where maybe your personal life is stronger, let's say on the East Coast, but your professional life is stronger on the West Coast. Yeah, that, absolutely. How do people then overcome the challenge of the dichotomy of, well, my, my professional life is stronger here and my personal life is stronger here. How do they then find a remedy to, to make it's stronger, you know, on both sides to bring both sides in. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense. I'm not sure that there's an answer. That's the balance of life. I think that's the the thing. How do you, you know, that you, your husband is a wonderful father, but he's not such a great provider. And and uh, and and your wife is a wonderful cook, but uh, doesn't clean the house. And uh, and uh, and a wonderful mother. And 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 that you you love uh, you you love. Florida in the winter, but you don't like it in the summer. And uh, this is just life, I think. The balance is, is you, you find what's really important to you and you, and you can work on your, on, your, on your lacks. You can overcome them. It's not a, there's not a, it's, it's not a, um, it, nothing is a void. Nothing is permanent. Everything changes. And so by, uh, you know, the outlooks and the views we had when we were kids, they're not relevant anymore, you know? I haven't seen a rotary phone in a long time, but we use that's what I used to use. Right. And Ellen, <laughs> I'm going to leave you with this. If you watch one of those Ellen segments on YouTube asking a, a millennial to use a phone book, a, a rotary phone, and there was one other thing, and they were unable to figure it out. So stay tuned. We're going to be back on <laughs> with more of Indra Rinsler um, after this break. So we're going to have more fun talk. All right, good segment, all clear. Thank you. Yeah, that was very funny to watch when you brought up rotary phone. How many people don't have a clue how to use it or are yellow pages? The young'uns, I'd like to say. I had a friend 
uh, a Finnish friend from Finland and uh, she got her check. She got a bank account in 1988 and she's never used a check. She's never had a check. In 1988, they didn't use checks. Wow, what did they use? They used bank wires like uh, most of Europe. <laughs> oh, that's so fascinating. See, and bank wires were so alien to me. Absolutely. But they are becoming more popular, transfers. Yeah, well, isn't that what Venmo is? Cash app? Absolutely. PayPal? Absolutely, yeah. We're, we're 30 plus years behind the times. That's our modern. <laughs> Pretty soon people won't know what to do with change or how to give out change. Absolutely. Because they won't know what a penny is because they'll stop making them at some point. Most likely. Yeah, just like those mercury dimes. Remember the, yes. the one that, what did they? Absolutely. Yeah, okay, now I'm really putting an age on myself. We've got to change this conversation. So, <laughs> is there anything that I haven't brought up that you'd like to talk about? I don't know. The Yugas? The oh, Yugas? Okay. You'll have to explain what a yugas is. I know you did once, but I don't remember. And then you can go on and talk about yugas. I want to then, talk about just people getting into their heart and just loving themselves. Okay. Even more than the yugas. 20 seconds. Okay, we're going to start with yugas and we're going to end with the heart because it's a okay. perfect way. Perfect. That's from a one too. Perfect. For, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I feel very honored. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> you are listening to Guided Spirit Conversations. To reach Marla Goldberg or her guest today, you're invited to call into the program at 1-888-346-9141. That's 1-888-346-9141. If you'd rather send an email, the address is guidedspiritconversations at gmail.com. Now, back to this week's program. Oh, welcome back, everyone. If you're just tuning in, I'm speaking with Indra Rinsler. Indra is a Vedic astrologer and an Enneagram professional. Um, and he reads the personality in your life readings. Check him out at indrarinsler.com. I-N-D-R-A-R-I-N-Z-L-E-R.com. See what he does, how he can work with you. Um, it's, it's an interesting experience. I know I've had it personally because I'd like, I wanted to try it out before Indra came on and the insights were really um, eye-opening. So check out Indra at his website. So it's charity shout out time. So welcome back Indra. And we're going to talk about your charity, Ganga Prem Hospice. Did I say that correctly? I believe so. Ganga Prem Hospice. Yes. Oh, Ganga. Ganga Prim Hospice, which is gangaprimhospice.org. So let's talk about Ganga Prim Hospice and why you have this affinity for supporting it, that charity. Well, we, uh, we spend a lot of time in India. We spend a lot of time in Rishikesh, my wife and I, and, and she was a volunteer for them. And uh, they, they, they developed a very saintly woman developed a hospice program there to take care of the Indians and um, does an incredible work. They have uh, built, been able to, with uh, funds, been able to build a hospital and build a hospice facility to care for people in their, in the facility rather than just their homes. People, people, uh, my wife experienced working with the cancer patients that were, you know, laying on the floor with a mm. pillow on their head. And that was basically what they had, you know, going through um, their transitions. And it's hard enough when you're transitioning with a disease like cancer, than to do it with such rough environment, with such a rough environment and uncomfortable. So who's to say which environment is rough and uncomfortable? <laughs> That's a great point. 
I guess it's what you're accustomed to. Well, I would say that my wife felt a real uh, sacredness in 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 these simple surroundings that touched her deeply. So that's lovely, absolutely lovely. So we were talking on break, and we were talking about the yugas. Let's talk about what is a yugas. So the you the the yugas are an Indian concept that there are uh, uh, four that there are cycles of. Uh, uh, that history comes in cycles, that there are periods of time. The, the Greeks had a thing called the Great Year, the Golden Age, the Silver Age, the Bronze, and the Iron Age. And so in India, we call them uh, Sat Yuga, that's the highest age, uh, Treta Yuga, which is next, Dwapara Yuga, and Kali Yuga, which is a term that people maybe have heard of, Kali Yuga, it's the densest age. And and I believe that we are in Dwapara Yuga, that we have left Kali Yuga behind. And while nobody in India believes that, the teacher that I got this from, the, the uh, guru of uh, Paramahansa Yogananda, uh, so this is a very well connected, his guru's guru is Babaji, the deathless saint, and he says that we're in Dwapara Yuga, the energy age. And when we look around, we do see the Kali uh -huh. Yuga form dying, but we don't see it as, um, but we see it dying. We see the density here, but it is leaving. And what's coming in is the energy age. And if we look at the last hundred years with the changes in science, a population has grown five times, uh, quantum theory, uh, atomic age, internet, universal healthcare, these are all Dwapara Yuga energy age concepts. And mm. so I believe this to be one of the core of my particular uh, teachings that I share is, is that we're a different age and we're and it's a different energy it's a different game and and so it while it gives while it can be used as giving us hope it gives us an understanding it's like it's like if you're going to dress for a trip you're going to check out what the climate is there right right before you Absolutely. pack yep Hopefully. Okay, so I am really happy to know that it's Dwapara Yuga, the energy age, rather than Kali Yuga, because the the dense forms of thinking are dying, and they make no sense. The limitations that we put on ourselves makes no sense. Is that, I mean, because that seems very, very much like the com a different conversation, but the same meaning of the, the veils lifting, the veils getting thinner, so you, you receive things more instantaneously people are going into the spiritual path more they're open to what's going on absolutely i think that would be part of it that that the the mystery some of the mysteries are being answered in the in kali yuga the dense age we're mostly concerned with uh, food on the table it's very it's very linear compared with now now is more uh you know you can watch a movie, you know, you're, you're home alone and there's nothing going on and you, you watch a movie and you get to, uh, you get to um, experience something that's not even there. And you can talk to somebody that's not there. I used to have a friend that I was, I could be, te I could be halfway around the world. And if I thought of her, she'd email me. And if yeah. I was in the same state, she would call me. She could feel it. She's very that's empathic. That's the, that's Dwapara Yuga energy. Okay. Well, that makes sense because it's becoming more and more people are being able to feel that energy happening to them because people are getting more sense, becoming more sensitive. That's right. And, and the, the, we need a climate, you need a climate for that sensitivity. You need to have a certain climate in order to be able to be sensitive. If you have a lot of noise around you, it's really hard for you to tune into your intuition because it's distracting. You you talk about multitasking. You know, if you're multitasking, it's hard for you to feel your intuition. And so and so this particular climate <laughs> of a higher age uh, helps us to to tune into these concepts that were unknown. Uh, uh, Hundred years ago. 
yeah, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, but they were known to people. St. Francis of Assisi was a high man. He was not Kali Yuga based. He, he, had, he was the first uh, saint to get the stigmata, and he had a connection with Jesus that, that, was, that was ethereal. And, uh, and, and so he was living in a very dead time, but his, 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 his personality talking about Italy, his, 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 not his personality, but his, his vision is what brought on the Renaissance hundreds of years later. That's amazing. It's, it's so amazing. I'm going to switch um, paths right now. Because on break, you wanted to make sure you were able to talk about people getting into their hearts. So I want to open up the space for you to talk about that um, before we close the show. Okay, well, uh, yeah, I think that the, these modalities are wonderful. And I have amazing experiences with my clients every day that I have clients that are uh, 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 helping them to break through their limitations by giving them an opportunity to, to see things in a new way, to give them a perspective. It's, it's, I'm not telling anybody anything. I'm not uh, telling them what to do. I'm only suggesting um, what you say, lifting the veils. And so really what it's about is to get into our heart is to, uh, uh you know there's a story uh, god says to mrs god where should i put the secret of life and uh, mrs god says uh put it in their heart they'll never find it there and so the the half an inch you know into our heart takes takes lifetimes takes decades takes takes years takes uh, months take can take uh weeks can take days it can take hours it can take minutes it can take seconds it's up to you and so i encourage people to just open up to your heart open up to your internal wisdom open up to the light inside open up to the joy that you feel it's not outside you there isn't anything to become you already are there there, so there, there. we have it words. inside us it's just a question of Accessing uh, getting it. rid of the uh, getting rid of the uh, outside barriers, noise. the limitations. Yeah, which I call outside noise. But yeah, getting you know and opening up and feeling because there are a lot of people who, due to circumstances, the way they were raised, things that they've heard, their wounds, their blocks, that they find it very hard to access the heart, and so absolutely. You know, trusting, going down and trusting your heart will never guide you wrong, will always take care of you in it, the highest and best good. And, you know, just allowing it to happen is probably some very sage wisdom. So there is the, the when you say the, when I say the heart, when you say the heart, it reminded me that I'm talking about a heart that's connected to the gut. I'm not talking about the heart that's connected to the head. So a lot of these right. desires and a lot of these needs that you feel in your heart are really are ego. And, and we have to be able to, how do we tell the difference? We tell the difference by, by, um, by how strong it is and by how and how where we feel it and and how important it is to us and 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 that is the work is to develop that sensitivity to distinguish between ego and mind and the true heart which has which has no needs and no desires other than to be right and to be exactly andrew i want to thank you so much um for being on the show for sharing your your sage wisdom your guidance and your information with us and i want to thank everyone at voiceamerica.com for all they do for getting the show up and running um keeping me on track so grateful i want to thank bridget my assistant right arm left arm for all you do again to keep me on track <laughs> so sometimes we need that um i want to thank you the listening audience for taking time out of your day out of your life to be a part of this show by listening to the guests and what they have to offer and how some of these things might be pertinent for you in your life. So look up Indra and in this case, um, because he's the guest this week at Indra Rinsler, R-I-N-Z-L-E-R.com and see how, how Indra can work with you and help you on your path. 
Uh, coming up next, following this show, is Rebecca Hall Greider, her Empowering Women Transforming Lives show. So stick around for that. It's, it's an enlightening show. And as I leave you, as always, I send you love, I send you blessings, and I send you gratitude. I'm so grateful that you took the time again to be a part of the show. I'm grateful that you're in my life in whatever capacity you're in it. And if you haven't heard these words today, I love you. You are loved. You are never alone. You are loved by your angels, your guides, your guardians, your high self, but you're also loved by me. So stay well, be grateful, and be kind. And I'll see you next week.